I'm extremely confident and optimistic that uh, we will be in a position to fulfill on our promises to support Ukraine with financial uh, means. That's the president of the European Council, Charles Michel, on Friday after Hungary blocked the latest round of funding for Ukraine. The bloc has vowed, though, to get that money to Kyiv when it meets again in the new year. But it's, of course, not the only funding challenges facing Ukraine. The U.S. Senate still struggling to reach an agreement on its own aid package, even after President Zelensky's visit to Washington. Those negotiations are set to resume tomorrow in the U.S., and the stakes are high for Ukraine. Andrei Zagorodnyak served as the country's defense minister from 2019 to 2020. He's now an advisor to the government of Ukraine and chairman of the Center for Defense Strategies. Andrei Zagorodnyak, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I want to start by asking you about the 50 billion euro aid package from the EU that was blocked by Hungary on Friday. Uh, EU leaders are promising that they will get that money to Ukraine without Hungary. But but how how big a deal is this for Ukraine? Uh, well, Ukraine needs Western assistance. That's that's obvious. And uh, the fact is, there is a pretty much unanimous opinion about uh, among the European leaders about supporting Ukraine. They all understand the strategic meaning of this war. They understand that Ukraine needs help. And this is a it's not just like sort of charity. It's the investment in strategic stability in the region. Hungary has a very different position in this war altogether. They are very close to Russia, constantly meet Russian counterparts and uh, essentially working against the EU and NATO at the moment. So this is a uh, this is a unique situation in, in the European continent when one of the countries, which is not like very large from a GDP perspective or, or military meaning perspective, but it's neighbor of uh, Ukraine and was a was a tiny part of the border, but uh, also with the substantial diaspora in Ukraine and and uh, they they just like simply working with Russians at the moment, and that's what we need to clearly understand. Yeah, of course, the other big funding and, and the funding delay that people are watching is the U.S. The Senate says it'll vote on that this week in the U.S., delaying its holiday break. How hopeful um, is Ukraine that that funding will get through, particularly after, of course, the president traveled there to say, we, we really need this? Uh, president's president's visit was to amplify the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the position and basically bring it directly to uh, to senators, to to media, to 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 establishment in in Washington. But generally speaking, we have a very strong support from both parties. The problem is that these both parties are like, uh, particularly Republicans, they're blocking initiatives of Democrats in order to sort of negotiate the other thing. So yes. Ukraine, yes. it's not it's not like majority of Republicans are against Ukraine. That's absolutely yes. not the case. Uh, it's just like internal politics are basically destroying our uh, our our plans. Yeah, which because there's a lot of fight about what's happening at the border and that kind of thing. You're right. But I wonder whether yeah. President Putin sees that um, and and believes or, or or tries to paint that as Western support drying up and, and whether that gives him sort of um, an information or a misinformation win on that front. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm sure that he understands the uh, basics of Washington politics. So he understands that there is a very strong core, pro-Ukrainian -Ukra pro core. So I don't think he sort of rests assured that, OK, everything is failing. But the other thing is what he projects to media, what he's sort of communicating outside. And obviously he's communicated that that's it. The West is not united. United States is not united. Everything is falling apart. Ukraine has no support. Russia is going to win all those sorts of messages. And so so that situation helps him a lot to solidify kind of a media, uh, his mm -hmm. media situation. Um, and uh, we just need to understand that and not give him that gift, yeah. you know. Yeah. Do you do, do you think that the expectations around the counteroffensive were set uh, too high, either either the speed at which it could happen or how it was going to unfold? And, and perhaps that is also creating some confusion. Uh, the expectations of a counteroffensive were quite um, realistic. Uh, okay. The problem was that it took uh, more than half a year to prepare for this. Quite a lot of equipment came quite late. Yeah. Uh, there was absolutely no element of surprise uh, because Russians clearly guessed where the counteroffensive is going to go because everybody was discussing this. 
every single shipment of weapons was uh, publicized in media so they could easily calculate uh, everything and so they just got prepared so they mm -hmm. created fortifications they created minefields and also of course the uh, the whole uh, war was influenced tremendously by introduction of the new platforms such as um, uh, if, uh, first person view drones and so on so right. so that part wasn't wasn't properly calculated during the counteroffensive preparation where is it at at this stage from from your assessment where is the counteroffensive at a uh, counteroffensive essentially is uh, is kind of stalled uh and uh, currently there is a a massive uh, a massive uh, attempt of Russians to uh, to breach our positions in uh, east of uh, east of Ukraine, with north from Donetsk. Basically, it's like areas like Bakhmut and uh, Avdiivka and so on. And uh, lots of troops currently working in that direction in order to uh, make sure that they fail. Mm -hmm. um, the Russians losing enormous amount of people there. Again, as recently U.S. administration publicized, we we uh, we uh, um, uh, created casualties for for over 90 percent of what uh, they had originally before the invasion which is huge for any other country that would be it that would be end of the story yeah. uh but the russians mobilized more people and uh, currently attacking so uh, but but the counter offensive uh in the south it kind of uh, changed in the direction in in terms of the eastern bank of Dnipro river and it's happening there and it's happening there quite successfully so uh not in the area where russians are for uh, fortifications built but on the area where uh the where the Dnipro river is and so essentially our troops are are, are, are kind of uh, developing their positions there so so it's the story is absolutely not over but of course winter and uh yeah. and the russian attempts in the east are kind of complicating things I, I, I spoke with Richard Haas uh, on this program a couple of weeks ago. He was uh, he's a former State Department official, uh, former president of the Council of Foreign Relations. He was talking about the need to redefine what success looks like in Ukraine, um, that, that perhaps regaining all of the territory lost should not be the primary objective right now. I wonder whether um, I wonder whether those conversations are happening or what you think of the idea that liberating, you know, 20 percent of the country um, is, is maybe not on the the table right now uh, I have to say with all due respect to mr. Haas we categorically uh, disagree I mean yeah. his position is is very detached from actual reality uh, we we understand he's a very serious scholar and very serious uh, you know analyst and so on yeah. but uh, there's a lot of analysts in DC currently are very very wrong about this situation uh, he thinks that territorial concessions or de facto concessions can actually lead to peace it's the other way around if yeah. Putin sees that we have stopped that will reinforce his position. He will say, okay, you see, we're winning, let's further move. And he will justify any kind of casualties, any sort of expenses uh, for that. And he will just still, still be moving with a new sort of energy. We need to make sure that Putin fails. And that's very clear because that's a strategic interest of all coalition and obviously Ukraine. Um, and uh, there's no reality where we can say, okay, Putin, take this piece of uh, Ukraine, uh, but stop the war. He will actually stop the war. It's just the reality doesn't exist. And it's very fanciful to think this way and uh, doesn't help. Uh, but, uh, but so, no, there are no such uh, expectations in the country and among the key allies. They very clearly understand that concessions are not going to stop the war. It actually will enforce it. Okay. Andrei Zegorevniak, thank you so much for making the time again thank for you. us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.